All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here, up alongside journalist David Sneed and former Dundalk goalkeeper Gary Rogers. Plenty to talk about when it comes to the FAI quarterfinals and also the draw for the semi-finals. We'll talk about that later on. Also, Shamrock Rovers in Europe. But this is the start of the last international break before the World Cup in Ireland of two crucial games. Coming up, Scotland on Saturday in Glasgow and then Armenia uh, coming to Dublin on Tuesday. And the squad was named last week. And Gary, I suppose the big talking point was Robbie Brady being reintegrated. And it's great to see him back and also what he's been doing with Preston recently. Yeah, absolutely. Look, first and foremost, Robbie's been on fire with Preston. He's picked up five Man of the Match awards in five consecutive games. I actually seen him play against Rotherham recently and then... Um, you know that he was man of the match in that too. So look, he he's been great uh, this season. It's good for him to like, he's living in Manchester. Preston's not too far away. He seems to be really happy, and uh, he's playing really really good football. And he's fully deserving of a recall. But he brings so much more. Like he's obviously a very talented player, but he bring a lot more to the group. He's a really good guy in around the group, and um, I think he'll bring a lot to a, a lot to the squad. And look, it's no surprise to see him back in. Yeah, and obviously we know Brady's versatility he can pretty much play anywhere across midfield and then, of course, left wing back as well, or even left back in a four if if needed. But obviously Ireland system is a back three, David, and the way Preston play, albeit they have problems scoring goals, but it's a 3-1-4-2 and he's sort of wide on the left. So he's definitely there as James McLean's deputy or even potentially maybe starting ahead of him. Oh, absolutely. Like as like, Gary's mentioned there, the fact that he's in actually really good form. I think James McLean has seen he seems to start the season relatively well. He's had a couple of assists as well. And it's just too experienced. I don't think we ever would have envisaged Robbie Brady and James McLean vying for a left wing back position at this stage in their career. Because like if you remember when Robbie when Robbie Keane retired, Robbie Brady was the one who put his hands up and said, I want the number 10 jersey. Like it was looking as if after the Euros in 2016, he was going to be the kind of creative force forward up the pitch. And just injury and injury and a bit of form and just kind of rebuilding his career has basically been what's the, been the name of the game for him over the last couple of years. And I think he was keen to stress after after the kind of the stint at Bournemouth that he was always available, even though he didn't really play, he was always fit and available. That was the big thing he kind of was wanting to get out there is that like the work he was doing to make sure he was fit was was paying off and he's shown that now at Preston. And yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Look, I, I'm kind of thinking if... Because on if you go back in the last in the last in the June window, like McLean was really good, was really impressive in that window. I thought in terms of the, the energy he provided, but also just he looked very settled in that position. Will he be displaced on the back of what Robbie Brady has done for Preston? Possibly not. But then every time you talk to Stephen Kenny about Robbie Brady, he's effusive in, about him in terms of obviously his ability and his character as a, a person around the squad. I think that's even one of the things that my not so much go under the radar, but can be maybe overlooked slightly is the fact that when he's back in around that squad, he just gives everybody a lift. He's that kind of character about the place and he's someone who obviously Stephen Kenny has wanted, to, not wanted an excuse to get him back in, but has wanted what he's done in his club career to get him back in, to give him that reason to come back in. And I think definitely over the next week, it could be interesting seeing Train and the two lads calling at it because it could go either way. I don't think he can say for definite that he won like that James McLean has that position and likewise that yeah Robbie Brady will definitely go in but it's it's an interesting one you kind of just wish they're maybe the both lads are maybe a few years younger because if they were and they were in the kind of form they were in and in in, in that system it, it, it could be something further down the line that would be really exciting whereas you maybe get the sense it could be a bit more of a short term thing and that's why you're looking in that position who is next coming through. Yeah, and obviously they're both of them are some of the older heads in the squad, but it's interesting that the older heads that are playing in the Premier League, David, are struggling for game time. Matt Doherty might not fit into the kind of oldest older head at, with, at his current age, but Seamus Coleman and Shane Duffy um, certainly are, and injuries for the first two have sort of been more, more or less the issue, but that's a bit of a concern. Yeah, and... <laughs> It, let's be honest like all this kind of times of players playing games it's always an issue for the last number of years with, with Ireland and it's just you can't get away from that and it was something that goes at the, the squad announcement during the week in the Aviva and it was something that was brought up the fact that like Seamus Coleman Matt Doherty Shane Duffy they're not just not playing football they're just not, get, not getting games for one reason or another and like Stephen Kenny said there it's, it's not ideal that it's something that they're going to have to obviously be considering and the fact that 
you've got the stage now where Andrew Omobamadeli has been very, very impressive getting back in after kind of having a bit of a, I think it was a, a kind of a back back issue um, with Norwich and he's gotten back in. Dar O'Shea, even though kind of West Brom, he really scored at the weekend, didn't he, against Norwich? But uh, O'Shea, even though maybe West Brom are struggling slightly, he seems to have been really impressive. He's pretty much an ever-present. And then obviously you have Nathan Collins um, as well. And like there is a decision there to be made and it's something that like it wasn't sometimes maybe a manager when they're talking about experienced players can kind of say well do you know what like he's going to give him the full back and it did seem as if kind of Stephen Kenny was maybe leave himself a bit of wiggle room there because he think he feels as if there might be a decision to be made in that defence you know yeah and Gary that obviously as uh, David has outlined Andrew Amadale in great form Nathan Collins has started quite well at Wolves obviously we'll talk about uh what was going on in the pitch against Manchester City uh, very shortly. And then, um, of course, John Egan with Sheffield United going well. And as uh, David said as well, Dara O'Shea scoring for West Brom at the weekend. So when you look at the back three and those central defenders, there was already discussions of maybe Collins moving ahead of Shane Duffy. But if you were to pick a three now based on form and experience, what way would you go? Um, I think I definitely have Collins in it. Um, he's He's been really impressive since he's come into the into the scene and, and like obviously with that move to, to Wolves he's done well I know he got sent off the weekend and that but he's been he's been very good so he'd be he'd be my main one and uh, probably John Egan as well and then I would be looking at um either O'Shea or Ove Van Medelli. like to be honest with you, I don't think there's a bad combination between them four I just think Shane's lack of game time at Fulham will cost him I think he thrives off playing and being sharp whereas I think the 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 of the other four I would I would have Egan, um, for sure, and Collins, and then I don't know. You can pick another one there. It, it, it's a great, it's a great. Uh, That's the thing is to have for Stephen Kenny. Though. I don't think there's a, like he will change it up. I think between the two games, you will get to see all four, maybe even a fifth centre back. But I think uh, Collins and Egan will probably be the two that might be the main players in it. Yeah, uh, certainly. And Collins probably as the as the kind of uh, the leading centre half, which I think was discussion after the June window. Um, obviously, at the weekend, himself and Jack Grealish had a little bit of a meeting on the pitch. Uh, Gary, uh, first, uh, your view on the challenge. I think everyone accepts it wasn't malicious, but obviously, definitely a straight red. I just thought it was a yellow. I think it was a yellow. Well. <laughs> Uh, look, it was definitely a red card, but like I don't think there was any massive intent there. Like he he was trying to play the ball. Obviously, look, it, it's clumsy, it's awkward, it's high, and you know, and it's on a, a high-profile English player. Um, so he's not going to get much leeway. The Irish man over there. So it was just, uh, yeah, look, it's just ending off. I think, um, obviously the characters at play uh, makes it a little bit more interesting. The fact that Jack was part of the Ireland 21s and they probably uh, came across each other on the underage route on the way up. But uh, yeah, look, it's a send it off. Um, I think he's, I think he's um, in fairness to Nathan, he's been, he seems to have a good head on his shoulders and stuff like that. He won't mm. let it affect him. Um, but he's been, he's been very good for Wolves since he's gone there and they'll obviously miss him in the next game. But, um, you know, it's a send it off. Like you tend to get things wrong at times and it's just a matter of time. I think he's, his time and generally is spot on. It's just one of those that he was just out by by a small bit. And like on that, sorry, but it, it, it was interesting. Like I I was I jumped on a Zoom press conference with Bruno Lage um a few weeks ago and just purposely obviously wanted to ask him when Nathan Collins was settling in. And like Bruno Lage is one of these people when you ask him a question, like he he'll give you an answer, like he will go off and he'll give you a bit, a bit of detail. And he was like just saying about Nathan Collins, like they had an idea of the kind of character they were getting, considering obviously he was the captain of Stoke City at the age of 18, kind of went to Bournley, boided, even in, when I say boided this time, it was one season, but like got into the team and done really well at Bournley. But he said like after a couple of days, it felt as if he'd been there three or four years at, at Wolves, just settled in right away. And obviously Bruno Lage would have been walked up Benfica with the likes of say Ruben Diaz and like, um, Can- Joe Cancelo in a few days. And he kind of just likened Nathan Collins' maybe mentality and just his character to say someone like Diaz and was like, like it was manna from heaven for me getting on that call because he was just mentioning the fact without, without much prompting, liking him to him and also the fact that he could be a future captain. And that seems to be a big thing with him is the fact that like it did... <laughs> Like I, I felt pretty bad. I wrote a piece of the 42 as a bit of a preview to the game saying like coming up against Haaland 
whenever we're looking at Nathan Collins now, because you kind of have a sense of you want to see how far he could go, like where it is his glass ceiling as a player. It's like all these moments, all these type of games are going to be the next indication of where he's going to be at for the next couple of years because he's like he's only just turned 21, you know? And like something like this, you would just hope and you get the sense that like it's not going to derail him too much. You know what I mean? It's not going to be a case of the manager saying, oh, I can't trust him. I think even Bruno Lage will probably think it was just, yeah, it was a misjudgment. It happens. But you fully expect, not just because maybe some of the players was let go, you fully expect that once his ban is up, that he'll be straight back into the team because already it seems as if he is a kind of like a focal point for that defence. Yeah, and as you said, the focus before the match was obviously how he's going to fare with Erling Haaland, given that I think we were talking a few weeks ago with Miguel Delaney about Erling Haaland after that first game having yeah. teething problems. And <laughs> and I think I said at the time, like, uh, if that's teething problems, I think he'd score twice against West Ham of the day. Um, you know, you'd be scared what happens. And obviously, no. he's gone on to street, uh, steamroll everybody. But um, Collins, you would have imagined, wasn't going to be faced by that challenge. And he actually did OK on Haaland himself before, obviously, the the incident. Yeah, like it's, see, it's a tough one, but like, I don't know. I, I kind of just get to say, like, you can't look beyond the red card. That's, that's why like, I don't think maybe, let's be honest, I know Gary Lennon is better than anyone. Like footballers always want to rely on if when something's bad's happening in the game, rely on what was the ultra positive? What's the positive they can take out of a game to actually learn from? And maybe that would be it. The fact that maybe he looked a bit, bit more comfortable, but they were still losing at that point as well. It wasn't as if like, Wolves were properly well in the game. And I think it's just something like, like, I don't know, like, as a player, like, how do you learn from that? Is it just a case of, he obviously felt he had the ball, it was a misjudgment, and maybe you just, I don't know, like, what, what do you do? Do you learn, like, kick him a bit lower so it doesn't seem as if it's a red card? I don't know, like, how do you be a bit, how do you learn in that situation? Is it just about your time and your judgment or no one actually just don't go for that type of attack? Because it is the type of attack now you just can't, you cannot get away. As soon as you, it's not the whole thing, even if you're not even that high, as soon as you're deemed to be out of control, that's it. You're pretty much going to get a red card, even if the tackle is lower on the ground. So, um, I don't know. I'd say that's the thing he has to learn from that, rather than say taking the positive of doing okay for the minutes before that. I just think he has to kind of look back at that incident and actually I don't know how you learn from it. I'll be honest. Like, yeah, just on that, Gary. Actually, because obviously everyone's different and deals with setbacks differently. But in general, is it the best thing sort of just to kind of put it out of mind and just accept it's a it's a mistake and a misjudgment. Yeah, look, it's a, it's just a mistimed tackle. I don't think there's any great drama about it. It's like it happens all the time. I think, you know, guys get things, it happens in training every day. And um, I think, you know, it's one of those, he's probably tried to nip in ahead of him and win it and be proactive rather than reactive in, in his defending. But like, I think, look, I don't think it'll be any uh, big deal for him to move on from it. Look, it's a sending off um, happens, you know, whether right or wrong. Like in, in this instance, look, it was the correct decision. But I think he has just put it to bed and move on. He's that kind of mentality and character that, I don't think it'll phase him whatsoever. Yeah, no, certainly any interview I've seen of him he seems to be one of the most level-headed characters you, you'll come across. But um, that sort of took away a little bit from the focus that was previously on Michael Abafemi and uh, Swansea, which I think had been the talking point when Stephen Kenny had named him in the squad. Because, of course, at Swansea, Abafemi has been left out in recent weeks after move to Burnley, didn't materialise. And Russell Martin the manager did discuss his situation as well as Ryan Manning at their press conference ahead of their win over Hull, David. And it's, it's the line that kind of jumps out is his response to Stephen Kenny saying there was three sides to the story. Mm. He says there are no three sides to the story. And he was a bit disappointed by Kenny's comments as well. You know, I, I'll be honest, I honestly believe in football. There are always about 10 sides to any story. Like there's what someone believes is their truth, what the other person believes is their truth and, and everything in between. So like, it, it seems to be a black and white. It seems to be a case of that maybe Michael Obafemi wanted to maybe get that move. Wasn't it Bournemouth had come in for him on, on transfer deadline day? Russell Martin was obviously believes he, he's not maybe in the right frame of mind to still, well, to be in, even in the squads. And he, he's spoken about maybe having to win back the trust of players and stuff like that. So, like, you can take only take what, what's coming out at face value, I suppose, on that. But, yeah, like, Stephen Kenny obviously had spoken to him, which is a, it seems to be a bit of a, a kind of a constant where, like, 
on a slight tangent, he referenced the fact that he wouldn't normally contact even players in the day of club matches, but he was actually in touch with Scott Hogan the day he scored against the hat-trick against West Brom, obviously yeah. getting he was going to be in the squad and stuff. But it does seem to be the case that say, Stephen Kenny would be a bit more hands-on in certain situations, trying to understand well what's actually happened at club level and obviously maintaining that dialogue. And he was in touch with Michael Oberfemi. Like It could have been something easy that as an international manager, you can wash your hands off and say, well, that's nothing to do with me. But obviously Stephen Kenny wanted to have an idea of what's going on. He's obviously spoken to Michael Oberfemi and that's what he said, what he said. Although it did seem as if it wasn't part of the quote from was Martin was talking about the fact that he had spoken to Stephen Kenny as well. So yeah, yeah. So that was where the yeah, he yeah. Was disappointed, yeah, about the the so, three sides of the story thing in uh off the back of that. Yeah, but like let's be honest, like he has to like Stephen Kenny can't be coming down one way or the other as well. He has to make sure his own player knows he has his he's fighting his corner for him as well a little bit or have that sense that he's got someone going to bat for him. So listen, it, it'll be something that'll be of interest for the next couple of days because it's an international window, but it'll soon blow over and Hopefully, Michael Obafemi can come in. And again, it was something, something positive. Like it was again, it was something that Stephen Kenny wanted to talk about the fact that even though maybe he hasn't scored the same amount of goals or the amount of goals that he would have hoped that already still has found the net. And he said it was all around performances up until now have, have been of a high standard. So he's still hopeful. I don't think it'll be a case that he'll lose his place in the team and um, because he hasn't been involved in the last couple of squads. So um, would, you would hope that it might give him even maybe possibly a, a bit more of a not so much a point to prove, but bit, give him something to have the, the bit between the teeth going into these games to uh, to get back on get back on form and score him. Yeah, and he got some game time against Hull as well, which will be very welcome, obviously, for himself. But um, yeah, he's part of a squad, obviously, where Troy Parrott's been called up. Obviously, Adam Ida out with injury for the foreseeable. But uh, you look at the form of some of the other strikers, like Scott Hogan, as you mentioned, just uh, hitting form at the right time. Also, Ogbene has been in really consistent form as well mm-hmm. up front for... Uh, for Rotherham. Um, so, Gary, when you look at the the forward options that are there, and obviously the Ob- or the Obafemi Parrot uh, partnership back in June, or at least in the Scotland game, that seemed to click really well. But then you've got all these other options as well. What way do you think Stephen Kenny will go? Yeah, I, I think Albany has to kind of be in the in, in the mix, like given the form he's in uh, at Rotherham, like he's been the main player, and he's been playing up top, and he's four goals in nine games. I would like to see Georgie Kelly play a little bit with him in his club form just because the two Irish boys together they haven't been the partnership as yet and Georgie scored the weekend or sorry last week but I think Ogbené comes in to, into the picture like Paris has been unfortunate because he'd been playing really well in the game I would have seen him get Rodham played really well in that game it was a really massive threat in it but just didn't score I think once he clicks into gear and gets a couple of goals under his belt um, you know, he could have a really good season for Preston yeah, it, look it's it, it, it's one that Stephen has to, I suppose, be careful with because you're looking at players who are scoring goals and are in form. Is Hogan and Albany a partnership? If he went with a two, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I think, but I, I think he probably won't go far away from what worked against Scotland. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be my my gut on it, and I think the fact that um, Obafemi has has played or got a little bit of game time, I think Stephen will be happy with that and, and probably use that and, and probably motivate him in terms of, you know. The, the bit of disappointment in terms of the move not going through, he'll be able to tap into that kind of uh, emotion to try and get the best out of him possibly for Scotland. So like it, it, it's one of those, it's in the balance that I, and it's what way Stephen kind of feels is, is best to go with. But I, I would imagine he probably won't veer too far away from what he went with, with Scotland. Yeah, and it comes at a time, it's almost a year since uh, Callum Robinson we went those that kind of run in October mm. of last year where he was in in brilliant form. Um, he seems to have slipped down the pecking order a little bit, uh, David. Yeah, it's it's you know he, he kind of he he's always kind of been a little bit of kind of a streaky player where he will have those kind of weeks or or games where he'll go off and he'll look really impressive. And which what what he's done, like go back to the Azerbaijan away, he kind of looked as if like, the goal, the goals there and then following up with the hat trick against um, Qatar, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, there? yeah, um, and even the goals, but it was all around play. He seemed as if he was like just he was he was busy, he was inventive, he was creative. Was what you are kind of looking for, and even Stephen Kenny, like going back going back to the very start against Slovakia in that playoff when he obviously when he was in charge for for that, and like Robinson was very important there, and then picked up an injury. But yeah, just sometimes other players can just maybe jump ahead of you and. Like he's gone now, wasn't he? He's gone to Cardiff. He's kind of got that move there. And you kind of just, you're kind of thinking, sometimes he's come in, he just seems to be one of these kind of players who 
even maybe when things aren't going great for him, it doesn't seem to dent his all around personality or his confidence around the place. He seems quite an effervescent fella regardless. And you kind of just hope that you can still bring that in. And I think like what Gary was saying earlier, like he's spot on. I don't think the team now at this point would vary too much from what it was against Scotland because that, that was has been the party that was all around and t- especially attacking wise the most impressive um performance without a doubt. And like if you're thinking well, can you come on and maybe help pick a pick a defense with like with a pass or, or do something he probably has that in to be that bit of a to be that bit of a player as well because he just has so much energy when he does come on and he, but he can also create as well. So but I just think other players now kind of jumped ahead of him in the pecking order a little bit. And I think I don't think he's the type of personality who will get a major hump by that and be put out by it and be a disruptive influence. I think all around he could still be a, a, a benefit a, like a, a character and a player that's gonna be could be of use maybe just more so off the bench in these two games. Possibly yeah. possibly in the second game depending on because sometimes again it's a point that Kenny's made sometimes or the some of the players haven't been capable of playing two games back to back in a short space of time. So it could be the second game at home where you, you we might see him starting. Yeah, and the other Callum as well, back in the squad, Callum Adauda, um, who's form for Cardiff is being rewarded as well, David. I mean mm. We, we we saw his injury hit spell with Bristol City, and it's good to see that he's he's getting a good run of games now, and actually uh, kind of regaining some of the form he'd had before. His role, and especially given the system, and sort of being more of a traditional winger, where we don't really play with that now, um, it seems he's more likely to be an option as a left wing back, but potentially yeah. also playing if they end up going five two three or something again. Maybe with tweaks, he can be used as a versatile option there. But pr- it, primarily, it seems like he's going to be uh, potentially just behind McLean and Brady, just as a as that extra option. Yeah, and I think I spot on. Uh, again, when when he was at when Stephen Kenny was asked about him last week at the squad announcement, a couple of things. I feel as if this could be kind of almost just like a, a soft reintroduction for him to the squad. I depending on how the games go and, and stuff or injuries, I would be surprised if he actually gets many minutes because it was quite pointed where Stephen Kenny was talking about. He was talking more so for the, about the European Championship campaign next year. So I kind of get the sense because he has been out of, out of the squad for a while, with the last little while, it seems to be him getting them, bringing them back in, getting them around the place again, getting them used to maybe some of the staff who were in there and obviously the players and just being around it. Um, and that it, the fact that even Stephen Kenny offered the information voluntarily talking about the European Championship campaign, I think that's what he's looking for. Uh, predominantly, I think left wing back could be could be a position again. You brought up the fact that he's played centrally for um for Cardiff. He's played in the left. He's played in the right as well. It was something that was said that you his versatility has been uh, his versatility has been quite impressive. So yeah, that's that's what I would say with with, with Callum O'Dell. Now listen, maybe it was a bluff, and maybe it was said on purpose. Like Callum might have a better idea of how Stephen likes to use the the media, but um mm-hmm. it did seem as if it was more so. It seems to be kind of like a soft reintroduction for him ahead of maybe uh, next year where he could have more of a prominent role. Yeah, and then uh, also in goal, definitely starting will be Gavin Bazzuni. Obviously, Queeven Kelleher um, out injured at the moment, as is well documented last week during the pressers. Um, but um, in regards to Bazzuni's performance for Southampton against Aston Villa on Friday, I don't know if you caught it at all, but it was just listening to the commentary and Gary Neville was sort of scrutinising the, uh, the he goal. always does that. He always does that. Like all keepers, <laughs> yeah, scrutinising the goal that Villa scored, where uh, Bazunu pams the ball up uh, on uh, from Watkins's header up onto the crossbar, and Neville's suggestion was perhaps he should have got a stronger hand to it and got it over uh, before the ball obviously fell back for Ramsey to score. But um, if you did catch it, Gary, um, what did you make of mm. that moment and his just his overall performances so far in the Premier League? Yeah, look, it's probably a frustrating one for him because he does get it. He actually, the fact, he gets too good a hand on it because he tries to push it up and get. Whereas if he just gets the slightest little touch, it goes over the crossbar. Where he got like he's tried to push it and develop it a little bit more. He's been unlucky. Like if that's going to be one of your mistakes, and um, you know it, it's very marginal, to be honest with you. Um, it come off the come off the crossbar and bounced around the goal and look, it was finished off. But yeah, look, I think. Uh, you know he's he's settling really well. Um, I know I suppose we we'll, we we'll look at this side, we we'll probably a little bit lenient on the UK media will be will be rootless over there in terms of um what he's doing and and Southampton obviously have haven't had the best of starts. But look, I think you know his performances and the way he's played and the way he's handled himself, you know you can see that he's a Premier League goalkeeper. Um, and you know that like we, we we're all well aware of him over here and what he's done. Obviously League of Ireland and. Going to Man City and his loan moves and, and 
so on and so forth. So, like, you know, in terms of what Gavin was doing, like, he's you know, at the minute, obviously, Mark has lost his place. He, he was playing with Bournemouth and Keevan is injured. So, he, he's nailed on the start. And I think, you know, that stability, you know, in that position will be good for Stephen because I think, you know, if Keevan had been available and fit, he has a bit of a conundrum. Whereas now, he doesn't really have any kind of question marks over the goalkeeping position because there's one man playing in the Premier League and uh, it, it, that, that goalkeeping jersey is nailed on to me at the minute. Yeah, and David, before we turn to the 21s, the other situation was just John Eustace, who obviously went on to, has gone on to take over at Birmingham City. And that was, it's been a few months now, or a couple of months now since uh, since that happened. But uh, as Stephen Kenny said in his press conference, no movement in terms of getting a replacement yet. And there was a quote, I think it's not a case of simply scratching off Eustace's name and going to the next in line. Like Barry before him, he had been identified and pursued. Yeah, like... Again, it was so, it was something where really, one of those domino effects in football where um I don't think I was no one was expecting John Eustace to leave at that at that point. I think it had been they'd been under the impression that John Eustace was gonna end up going to Birmingham City, but as Mark Warburton Warburton's number two when they had uh, left QBR and then Mark Warburton got the uh, got first team coach a job at West Ham, David Moyes came in from. So then that kind of changed things with Birmingham still wanted that kind of dynamic that, that had been at QPR. So obviously John Eustace and his local fella got the he got the job. So it's been it's been one of them where they were kind of looking at a sensible do they go through maybe coaches in who were in the FAI network and and bring and bring them up and promote them or do what they've done previously because it, it's it is and Stephen, Stephen Kenny is on record as saying and now the next appointment they want they want to make sure that that person is there for the full campaign for the Euros at least you know like it's about getting that right person in which I think is probably not so much that it's delaying the issue but it's maybe why they're taking a bit more of the time over it rather than just as you say going to the next person they want to make sure that it's going to lead to a bit of just consistency because like that's what that is what's needed in coaching staff so um and obviously the fact that this is what two two and window in the, the euro campaign will begin in march time as well so i think by then they'll, they'll have someone else in and like i think the next person who comes in will probably thinking one way or another it's going to be good because no matter what you might end up getting a job somewhere else that seems to be that seems to that seems to be the trend doesn't it yeah, we'll see how that plays out now anyway. But uh, obviously Scotland live on RT2 on Saturday and then we'll also have the Armenia game on Tuesday of next week. But the Ireland under-21s are also going to be in action this Friday, first leg against Israel and then second leg next Tuesday in Tel Aviv. And Gary, Aaron Connolly's been a senior international for a while, but him being drafted into the 21s is an interesting one. Yeah, I think it's a risky one, to be honest with you. Um, you know, that under-21 squad is kind of, fairly well settled you know there's a bit of rotation in terms of when there's injuries and players in form and out of form but like you know Connolly's gone away obviously we know there's been you know issues there off the pitch or on and off the pitch if you like um, and he's gone away like he's played five games he's, you know averaging around 30 minutes a game it's not as if he's like in outstanding form I just find that you know it, it, it's a risky one and you know does he come in and does he play because he's a senior international um, or how did you react to maybe not playing? So it, it, it just depends on what Jim's, I suppose, plan is for him. If he, could, if he plans to start him and play him, I think that's probably an easier route for him. If he, if he plans to bring him in and have him about the squad as an impact player off the bench, or does he go with the tried and trusted that he's used already? So it's certainly, you know, it's going to, it'll throw up a, a little bit more debate around the squad than you would generally have. And um, because like I said, you know, they've, the group and the team and what Jim and his backing team has been brilliant um, and they've had that kind of continuity. I know Colin Whelan has been in there and he's injured um, but you look at Liam Kerrigan's gone off to uh, Como and he's scoring goals and doing really well and his form is, is excellent. So um, you look at the, you know, in contrast, Connolly's form is, you know, it's a little bit hit and miss and he's, he's just coming in and, and I know he's trying to kind of re-establish himself and stuff like that but, you know, for games of this magnitude, I just find it's a little bit risky. But mm. you, know, you know, the manager will have a better guide on on the on the personalities within the group and and how it how it'll all play out and what his plan is. I think is is probably you know as important as anything. Yeah, because if we look at the front three that uh, Jim Crawford has generally played, Tyreek Wright generally is on the left, Carrigan on the right. So it kind of leaves that space in the middle where it's either been Ferguson or Coyote. Yeah, and to be honest, that, like, kind of, and we'll share some of Gary's concerns on, on a couple of aspects, but even through the middle, I don't see him 
I don't see how he could come in as that focal point, you know. And again, I was out there when 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 Jim announced the squad, and because he did it just after Stephen Kenny, and one of the points he made was the fact that he saw that interview that Aaron Connolly did a few weeks ago talking about realizing that he was making bad decisions on and off the pitch in terms of his work rate was poor, maybe the people he was but he could pour down to maybe the people he was associating with, but also just how he was carrying himself off the pitch and what he was doing and just his general demeanour. Like, it was rubbing a lot of people up the wrong way A football club, but what he was doing on and off the pitch, you know? And, like, Jim Crawford made the point, and it's true, like, talk is cheap. Like, he spoke to Connolly himself about it, and one of the points which I thought was interesting what Jim laid out was the fact that he explained, well, this is what's going to be expected of you in terms of that kind of the close-knit, the close-knit kind of nature of of that squad and like it was a surprise like you're looking through it and like you're kind of thinking if, if he was banging in the goals you're probably thinking well he's going to go to the Ireland he's going to go he's going to, Ireland. He's going to go to the senior team that's what you might think but like he's he hasn't been pulling up trees really so far and he's been maybe getting in and maybe that conversation that he's had was enough to to convince Jim Crawford that it was it was worth it and that he he will still be he'll have to kind of the character to come in and, and, and settle in and not be an influence around that could ca- cause any any issues but again it's because of the magnitude of the game it's not as if maybe you're doing it in the middle of a campaign where you're looking for a bit of a spark and you're struggling and you want to maybe like it's the end of it it's the two most important games they're going to play do you know what I mean and yeah. like it's a decision he's going to like it's a decision that will probably come not, I think coming to define the whole campaign maybe is a bit harsh. So I don't think including Aaron Connolly will be will be the reason that they were doing not qualify. Like if he comes on and scores, well then obviously you will. It's great. He's he's played an absolute blinder. But just kind of shows maybe with the 21s, like the depth of talent that can be there. Like, because even in terms of surprises, like when I was coming in, like you see it, and like like you say, Killian Phillips, who's at Crystal Palace and has been involved in Premier League in, in the first team squad, is impressed usually in a short space of time and, and it's gotten in around that four team environment at Crystal Palace when you can leave a ladder like that off in, in, a, in a key position where a position where maybe you're not 100% blessed when you've obviously lost, got, lost Gavin Kilkenny as well that kind of just gives you an indication maybe of the depth of talent that can be there as well and, and stuff like that too so like I think it's a weird one like unless after this game unless after this game stuff comes out about the Aaron Connolly and how he's been around the place but I think you have to take take the, the lad on his word. Like he's still the fact that he still qualifies for twenty one shows you, like where he's at in his career and the stage and that. Like you can I think you can allow a lad make a few mistakes at that point. And if he has wised up and he's, do you know what? He's hold, he's holding his hands up publicly to say, right, we haven't been doing good enough. This could be maybe that catalyst that we can see. And again, Jim Crawford made the point as well that it's 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 going to be looked upon by favourably, obviously, by the senior management. And it could be a way back into that senior squad as well by how he conducts himself. So you would hope that it's it's only going to lead to a positive and it, and it should help or But it will be a decision that will be scrutinised if things don't go well. Yeah, he didn't play against Pisa, I think, at the weekend, but he did um, start two of the previous three games. So he is getting a bit of game time. As Gary mentioned as well, Liam Kerrigan has been getting plenty of game time at Como too. Fessio Ebocelli, less so at Udinese, um, apart from the debut against AC Milan. But um, other people in the squad in midfield, Dawson Devoy, an assist against Oxford, Gary, at the weekend. And he seems to be settling in well now in League One. Yeah, you know, he, the guys are doing like Dawson's a very talented player. Was like excellent at Bohemia, particularly last year in in their really good uh, European run, and it's good for him. Now he's obviously had a little bit of time there, you know, he's a couple of months now, and he's settling in and having a real impact on the game. Like he's got ter- terrific quality. Another one I really like is Will Smallbone. Uh, as uh, he's yeah. gone on loan to Stoke City, and for me, you know, in the in the previous games, he's been the he's been the the the, the standout midfielder. And, and if anything, he's looking at going the other way in terms of senior international call up. But um, I think he'll be it'd be important um, in around it because like although Dawson is doing well, I don't see him starting ahead of Will Smallbone. To be honest no. with you, I think um, he'll be he'll be you know the mainstay for that squad over the course of the two games. Yeah, and Gavin Kilkenny also on loan at Stoke. Also, well, unfortunately for him, out of the squad for this one, but Luca Connell brought in. So um, it'll be interesting to see how they get on. But uh, David, obviously, Israel, uh, tough enough challenge. I mean, they have a bit more experience in terms of getting to major tournaments at 21s, at least um, from previous generations. And um, looking at their results in their group, only really Germany and then laterally Latvia um, got decent results against them. Yeah, like... 
I'll, I'll, I'll be honest in terms of looking at I, I've only been looking at it from that, that point of view of you're saying there as well of what their results have been rather than knowing too much exactly about like well the calibre but they're in the same similar position that's the only way you can look at this aren't they? they're in they're in the same position as Ireland here so you would like to think that's not as if Ireland should be going to this game with any level of kind of trepidation or saying we don't know what we're out of our depth here do you know what I mean it's a playoff you're in the playoff because you're of a similar standard and like just to put to pick up on mm-hmm. the point that that Gary made about Will Smallbone like I think again we talk about people growing into a campaign as it went on like the last couple of games the goals he got and just his all around play like he was really becoming that talisman and that's what you're looking for again like you know what I mean sometimes players as the campaign grows and he, he, he really has and that's what you're hoping now coming into this that you can take some of the form that he's been in with Stoke and that environment as well, like that level to be playing at that level. Cause like, yeah, the championship, he's gone from Southampton, he's wanted to play football, but like the championship is still a serious level. If you think about it, like it's a lot like the amount of quality that's it, that is around there. And you would hope that coming in, like he's going to just have, you would ho- you want to just see, I'm looking at it from the point of view of like a player who was pl- playing the Premier League and looked as if he was going to be a Premier League regular at Southampton from an, an early age, has a really bad injury, comes back from that, is is rebuilding. And this is another building block for it. And the, the, campaign that he's, um, the campaign he's had for the 21s has kind of shown that a little bit that he's able to take on that responsibility and that mantle, not just as a creative player and someone who can deliver, but as that bit of a leader, someone that players look to. And that's what he seems to be. And I, I just think that if Ireland having like, like the first leg being at home as well like if they can go and just put on a performance and try and impose themselves I think he'd be the one who'll maybe set the tone for that and, the, and can be that catalyst for it yeah so and all, I mean. yeah and all those international matches senior and under 21 live on RT2 and the RT player over the next week and we also had Derry City Shamrock Rovers in the FAI Cup quarterfinals yesterday and if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to watch some of the goals and things just as we as we talk over the next few while, including from the other three games as well. And the draw was also made live on TV last night for the semi-finals. Waterford against Shelburne and Derry City against 3D United. And they're all going to be played on the Sunday, 16th October and live on RTE. And uh, the obvious headline from that, two first division teams, Gary, uh, great results for them on Friday night. Yeah, well, the, probably the more obvious headline was possibly that the fact that Conor Bourne didn't get to make the draw this time round. You know, there was that ball. <laughs> but yeah, look, it, the, the result of the weekend. Fix. Fix. <laughs> and Patrick did it, so he wasn't he wasn't asked the back. Um, but look, it, you know, the, the result. You know, it was brilliant in terms of seeing, I suppose, new faces, if you like it, in the semi-finals of uh, of the FAI Cup. The FAI Cup is a terrific competition. Uh, for Treaty to go out and, and, and obviously four home wins as well. It you know, just goes to show the importance of that home draw. And then you've got Derry City at home to Treaty and um, Waterford at home to Shelburne. They'll be really, really interesting games. Um, like I, I think it has sparked a certain So I think Bohemians and Shelburne game yesterday, it was probably a bit of a surprise how poor Bows were in that game and how. I wouldn't say how good shells are because what you what you got from shells is, is what they are in terms of you got really really high intensity work rate from all from everybody like they to a man um put in a great shift and uh, you know got the rewards for it. that game was it really in the balance I suppose at two nil and um, Jordan Flores hit the cracked the shot off the off the upright and came back out and and Sean Boyd then. Like showed great endeavour, worked the socks off, won a ball back, drove through the middle and finished off and the game was over and it was 3-0. So like, you know, for Shell to be in the cup semi-final, Damien Duff would be delighted with that. But then for Waterford, you know, Waterford terrific against against Dundalk. Like probably, I suppose Waterford, they've got real firepower in Patterson up top and and, and Junior and they've got some real good quality there. So it, it's it, interesting game. Obviously Derry City will be favourite a home draw in the semi-final against the first division team. There's no doubt about that. They'll be like, they'll be licking the lips of that one but um, the, the FAI, Cup, FAI Cup is definitely it's a little bit more to it because it's not Dundalk and Cork in the finals for the last number of years you know so it's, it's great to see some, some new blood in it I was going to say it's it would actually be the most League of Ireland thing in the world if Waterford win the FAI Cup like yeah. just purely because like the madness that's gone on at the club and everything that's gone on in the last couple of years from what happened at the end of last season with Mark Bircham, who's now heavily involved with Como, and obviously Liam Cardigan has ended up there. But like, you've got like losing the playoff, the manager the sacking the manager, the manager ending up in, in the away section with the with the fans cheering it, that team on coming down to change of ownership, new manager, some new players coming in, and then like 
Jeff, if ever there's been a name on a trophy, I'm just I'm convinced it's going to be Warford. I've no idea why. I just think it's just it's so mad that it's going to happen. Yeah, we, we'll call that one now. But if we start on treaty, actually, uh, David, I mean, uh, it's obviously a for for Enda Curran um, scoring a hat trick in a in a FAI Cup quarter final against the Premier Division team in the shape of UCD. It's obviously great for him, but. For the club, it's, it's uh, itself. It's also massive. Obviously, they're in the uh, they were in the playoffs last season. They're fairly set to be in it this year as well. But there had been talk about the size of the crowd and the need to get more people in at Markets Field. And obviously, they got the biggest crowd there um, all season at the weekend. Yeah, like it's a, it's a strange one because obviously everyone goes back to it, the fact that how the team was pulled together maybe the start of last year and, and the fact that players who would be say amateur and they wouldn't be obviously that full time for them but it's also just testament to the to the work that's gone on there but in terms of say you're talking about the crowd and, and getting that again this just comes back to it like that's not going to happen overnight it's not as if like you might you might get not a few coming in because of a team being success, and successful but the only way that it's going to happen is by just prolonged investment obviously in the in the team but, but what's the nature of that what's the level of that that they, that they can do but also just being entrenched in the community like Limerick like we talk about like football in Limerick and everyone talks about you know like the junior scene and, and all the rest so that's clearly been seen with some of the players who've come in but also we've added some decent enough League of Ireland players too otherwise they, they wouldn't be where they are as well so I just think it's going to have to be a case of like it's, it's clear that they've They've got a core group there, which is which is obviously needed to get where where they have been. But to use it as a way of making sure that like it's not a flash in the pan and that they stay, because that's the only reason why you're going to be able to attract crowds. And the fact as well that would happen, and it's it's going to happen now. Obviously, I know obviously Shane Keegan was involved there at the in the youth section before he went to Cove, but that's going to be a big thing too. And like you've seen it throughout the the crowd uh, throughout the league, and it's something that I've noticed maybe. Listen, it's more so anecdotal. Like you don't know what the exact figures are, but you do see an awful lot of more kids around and at matches and and say with families. And I think part of that definitely is because of the underage structures that are in place as well. And just that there's a lot more young kids now associated with with, with clubs. So that's all going to feed into it. And like we're talking about, we always talk about it, but it feels like, especially from the, the media point of view, of trying to sell a cup final because of the crowd and all. And like last year, I thought it was quite easy. It was two Dublin clubs. It was the first time, I think it was two Dublin clubs in the, in the final in the Aviva as well. So that was, that was one of the reasons why I think the crowd was over. Was it 36, 37,000 or something last year? I think it was. Yeah. It was quite significant. Um, like this year, if you're looking at it, like, like what what would be the ideal final for the FAI or for trying to fill with the Aviva? And you would think, and it could be wrong, you would think Derry, Derry and Shelbourne would be the, the final that, that they, would, they would want for that. But like you just hope that this is something that can be used just to build, like, you always talk about it but in football, but consistency. And if we're talking about that for a club, that's what Treaty will need because they're only a young club. Yeah, and from the Waterford, Waterford point of view, um, obviously booking their place in the semi-final against Shelburne and given where they are in the first division in terms of very safely in the playoffs, not really uh, threatening automatic promotion, they can almost laser, like, laser focused um, on this semi-final. And as you said, you've etched their name on the trophy anyway, David. So, <laughs> but uh, that, 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 That's just because of just pure madness. There's, <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, there's uh, no uh, logic. There's no real logic. Uh, but they're in the semi-final. They're in the semi-final. David, David's just thinking of all the stories he can write out of it. <laughs> oh, stop. Yeah. Especially all the it's, angles. It's, Especially as a freelancer, like if 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 Waterford get to this, like this will seem to show Christmas. Fair enough, that's good. Good for bank, <laughs> bank balance. But uh, right. um, on, on a more serious note, obviously, look, the three two win over Dundalk. I mean, they would have come in as underdogs, but two sides of it, I suppose, Gary. A, what's happened to Dundalk in the last few weeks, gone off the boil. Obviously, Patrick Hoban's injury is probably one factor, but also from a Waterford point of view, um, you know, they've, their form has been a little bit inconsistent up and down. They've obviously got the new owners in there and it's just an interesting f- time for them as a club. Yeah, look, they, they are, a, a, I suppose, a turning point in their development of new owners coming in. There's great quality in Waterford. Um, there's, if they can get a, a grip of it, then they there's a real appetite for football in Waterford City. Um, tradition, there's massive tradition there as well. They've got excellent facilities in the RSC and there's really good training facilities in Waterford IT. So in terms of, you know, there's a lot of really good stuff in Waterford. They've got some experienced players there and they've got some real quality. So like, like it probably wasn't a big surprise to me that Waterford um, turned Dundalk over given the fact that UCD beat Dundalk um, the previous week. I think Dundalk's form at the minute 
one thing about Dundalk earlier in the season they were really difficult to beat and they kept a lot of clean sheets at the minute you don't have to play particularly well against Dundalk to score goals um, they're just coughing up too many chances um, Pat Holman like, basically, although he's a striker that has an effect on it because Pat like dictates the pre- or dictates the press and leads the line and, and makes life hard and doesn't allow teams to build up uh, another factor then is Connolly, who went to Derry City. Yeah, because obviously um, he's, he's left um, hmm. when they were in such good form defensively, yeah. I think. And then obviously that's uh, that's been taken away. Yeah, and they're two key players, not only in Dundalk, but if they were in any team in the League of Ireland, they'd be two key players. So um, like there's a couple of factors there that, that have contributed, obviously, to you know Waterford um, you know, beating Dundalk in, in the Cup. And it ultimately, it's disappointing for Dundalk. But they have to kind of regroup and try and focus in on the remaining league pictures because, you know, they're, they're in a position where they can get themselves into Europe, um, uh, uh, whether that's um, in their own right by, by finishing uh, third or second. Um, but they'll be cheering Derry City on if, if, they, if they finish fourth. But parts of the team in terms of the league it, that are in form, like Derry, coming on a good run off the back of Europe. So, like, Dundalk can't afford to let their guard down at all and they really have to finish the season strong. Yeah, and you touched on Shelburne a little bit earlier on. Um, obviously beating Bowes three 0 to book a place against Waterford in the semi-finals. <clears throat> but uh, let's listen to Damien Duff. who was speaking to Adrian Eames after that victory yesterday. You could argue it's been coming. We, I think we've deserved to win three out of four games. But listen, words are cheap. Um, so absolutely brilliant performance from the guys. And the way I describe it is they've played the perfect game from minute one to the last kick of the game. I think a lot of people, Damien, enjoyed it as an occasion. Lovely sunshine, packed Tulka Park. Did you enjoy it? Um, yeah, listen, I did. It's obviously nerve-wracking on the side. I won't, uh, I won't lie about that. But, um, yeah, listen, absolutely brilliant performance. The standout victory, I guess. I was waiting for kind of one of them at home, you know, a big, big Dublin derby, obviously cup quarter-final here at Tulka. We've had some amazing wins, amazing, amazing performances this year, but I don't think we've delivered that in like that as yet, so today was brilliant for everyone involved with Shelburne. You said after the win over Bray Wanderers in the opening round of the Cup that to win the Cup with Shelburne as boss of Shelburne would be the pinnacle of your career. That's quite a statement given all that you achieved in your career with Premier League medals and 100 caps for Ireland. Is, is that still the dream to win the Cup now with Shelburne? Absolutely, and without doubt, I, you know, it absolutely would be the pinnacle of my career. Football, being a footballer, that's all I ever knew and that's what I did since I was 7-8 so you know to do that as a footballer was just went hand in hand with I guess practicing day in day out whereas you retire okay what will I do being a manager being a coach is alien to me I'm learning the game all over again so it's absolutely out of comfort zone stuff I'm doing so if I was to win at Michelle's without doubt would be the pinnacle yeah Okay, so Damien Duff there chatting to Adrian Eames afterwards. Gary, I suppose the, in the build-up, uh, some of the focus had been the run of form Shelburne were on. Obviously, they've had a solid season in terms of being a promoted club, and uh, you know they're def- <clears throat> definitely safe, and they can build towards next year. But they had been struggling for goals in the last in the last few weeks, and also struggling to get results. So this is huge for them on that front, but also as a club as well, they've been waiting a while to get back to a level where they're close to getting to a final. Obviously there's, there's still the challenge of getting over Waterford first before they even think about that. But as a club and for Damien Duff in his first season in charge, that was a huge result. Absolutely. It was brilliant. Uh, and it was a terrific game and atmosphere and everything around it. And you're right. I thought shells are not a free flowing, like scoring team that they get two and three goals for. So to go and win, <clears throat> Excuse me. That game, it's three nil, and given what was at stake, was it was a big surprise. Um, not massive surprise that they won, but just the fact that you know they could go out and score three goals. The performance that the game was excellent. As I said, the work rate from all the players was brilliant. And probably a reason why they, they you know, they probably struggle for goals a little bit is Sean Boyd seems to be suspended for a number <laughs> of games. Like, and he, like, and this is not having a go at him. But I think if he can stay on the pitch um, and not rack up as many yellow cards. He was absolutely excellent in the game um, yesterday. What you want from a front man, lead the line really well, worked the socks off, was a real handful for the for the defence, um, and got and took his goals really well. So like it, it, they have somebody like a focal point that probably Bohemians didn't have in the game, you know, to, you know, to launch their attacks from. And I think you know with Jack Moylan and Farrell either side, they've got a real threat. Now Jack scored a terrific goal. The first goal was a smashing goal. Picked up an injury. See, like for Shelburne, they'd be hoping. 
Like obviously they won't rush him if if it's an injury that you know they'll, they'll, they'll have one eye in the semi final. They won't be rushing him for league games because they are safe. But yeah, like I think um, like Sean staying fit and 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 not picking up as many cards, yellow cards and a couple of reds as we we know, um, could be could be uh, could be key for them. Yeah, and on the flip side, David, before we uh, touch on Derry City Shamrock Rovers in the the last semi final or quarter finals that was that was played, um, Bohemians, I mean. It, they're in a they're in transition anyway because obviously they've uh, parted ways with Keith Long. Derek Pender's in there as interim manager for the moment, and also they're not you know they're not in danger of going down, and they're nowhere near um, qualifying for Europe either. So it's sort of back to the drawing board for them. Yeah, no, it is. It's kind of like it's a strange one in, in in a sense going out of the cup at this point. And obviously, Derek Pender t- spoke about it. He said the, the performance pretty much I think disgraceful was what, what he what he said. And if you look at some of uh, just reading the reports of it, it does seem as if it was a case that I think it was playing basically shells up like a team and balls up like a lot of lads were trying to get our kind of thing. Um, and that just seems to be how things are at a balls at the moment. It just seems to obviously since Keith Long, well, and even leading up to Keith Long's departure, there was a bit of a sense of drift there. And that seems now that's going to be the case of what do the, the balls board do now? Obviously, like interviews are still going on for the actual, the manager's job. And, at the moment, I don't know for certain if they zeroed in on an actual target. One hundred percent, it does seem to be a case of it could that the could, that race for that job could still be open. They, do they take their time now and say, well, just like let the season like peter out? Because as you say, it's not as if they're going for it. Either way, it's but then there's a danger in that as well because like you take that level of, of that atmosphere and there's a bit of there's a bit of anger there in the stands towards some of those players that are in the, on the pitch as well. You know what I mean? And like, that can't really be allowed because that can. That can mushroom very quickly. That could become dangerous, you know, as well if you allow that atmosphere to kind of just become almost a bit of the norm. So I think getting a new manager in sooner rather than later, who do you actually feel that's still important? Because you want them that you want the manager to see who will around the place who who does he want to keep as well and going into the the off season because let's be honest, already they'll, they'll be behind the eight ball. Clubs will be preparing for the for the winter and for next season in terms of targets already that's just the nature of, of how the league operates so um yeah like i think sooner rather later balls need to get the house in order because otherwise it could be another stable transition could be another difficult season uh next next year too if they don't get, get things sorted quickly because as i said other well, clubs will just be catching them on the hop and getting targets in before they leave and be out of bed now. Yeah, and Derry City are going to be favourites for the cup now, obviously with the with the teams remaining and where they are at as a club. But let's listen to Cameron Dug- Dummigan, who was speaking to Tony O'Donoghue after they beat Shamrock Rovers after extra time yesterday. Congratulations! What a night! What a result! Oh, definitely. We knew it was going to be a tough game throughout, but we just have to stick to what we do best, and that's just get after them as early as possible and just keep on top of it. Early as possible as well because you started so well. I mean, you were drifting into the far post. You had a, a shot saved by poles. You had one that hit against the crossbar. I know some nights you just don't have your luck. Unfortunately, one of them nights for us, for me, sorry. Um, but we thankfully got the result we wanted and on to the next round now, that was all that matters. When the penalty hit the crossbar, like yeah. did that change the atmosphere? Because um, Rovers came back into it, didn't they? Yeah, true, but we've had many nights where and um, we've had loads of chances and just couldn't find a net. And then after the penalty, I thought, oh, not, not again. But thankfully, we just dug in deep and got the result we wanted. Super goals to win it as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, every goal's a good goal, especially in a cup anyway. So Cameron Dug- Dummigan, uh, man of the match yesterday. And psychologically, Gary, that was a huge win. We've seen them put it up to Shamrock Rovers in the league in the three ma- uh, matches that they, they faced them um, as the season has gone on. Obviously, they won the first one, um, possibly fortunate towards the end because of a Pico Lopez um, error. But the next two performances, they didn't get the results that perhaps their play deserved. So beating Shamrock Rovers in the way that they have, obviously huge for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think they'll take great confidence out from it and, and not to beat them in the brandy well. Look, I know man sent off uh, and they could have made life a little bit easier for themselves Obviously, Will, Will Patching hit the crossbar for the penalty and, but to be fair to Shamrock Rovers in the game like down to 10 men you know to get, get themselves back into the game and to get the extra time was an achievement in itself because it, you know, Derry dominated the possession um, I think Brian Mark probably would be a little bit disappointed with the goal that they can see and, and Shamrock Rovers were already got there you don't want to be give, giving him an easy because he's been in terrific form this season so for them to take it extra time um, you know, off the back of playing in Europe on on Thursday night um, and traveling and all that, we, we speaks volumes for them and and um, the character that's within that group. But for Derry City, it's a massive moment for them. 
and and for Rory Higgins and the staff, you know, they're kind of a team that's uh, building and growing towards like they're 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 on the cusp of a of a title challenge, but you know they really feel they've got a great chance of of picking up some some silverware this year, and um, you know they've got great quality players there as well, so it'll give them confidence, you know, you know even for the for the remaining fixtures in the league. There's no wiggle room really for them. They've they've got to win their games. They can't make any mistakes. I think they've got to win all their games if they're going to win. If they're going to win the league, they can do it certainly. But um, you know, the, it, it, that pressure for a new group and some players won't have experienced it before. You know, to, uh, and to be able to apply that pressure to Shamrock Rovers on the run in will, will be difficult. But you know, I suppose in terms of the FAI Cup, I think they'd, they'd, they'd be delighted to be sitting in the semi final with another home draw and the brand new will be packed out for that one. Yeah. Gary, sorry, I wonder actually, Gary, can I just ask you on that? Because that's actually interesting. Like, how how will Mickey Duffy and Pat McElhenney, how would they like when when things the going gets tough? Like, what, what are those kind of because whenever I've spoken to them, they just seem very both and just seem very relaxed and laid back. Mickey Duffy wouldn't even know that the going was tough. He's so relaxed. <laughs> just Mickey Duffy just goes out and plays football. Like he I don't think he has a care in the world in terms of when when he, he just wants to be on the pitch. You have to drag him off the pitch. All he wants to do is be out kicking footballs. And there, I'm, I'm, McElhenney is the same. Like they're just, they just love football and they want to be out there all the time. Like Dum, like Cameron Dummigan is another guy who's the same, like real relaxed kind of demeanor. And, but what a player can play right, probably the best right back in the league. But he's playing sitting in front of uh, that that deeper midfielder like the Chris Shields kind of role. But but Dummigan is another character, really really good character, superb footballer. Probably knocking on the door for a Northern Ireland international call up, if, if, you know, given this form. But yeah, they, they've got real quality in that group. Um, but guys who are, you know, they, they won't feel massive pressure. But it, it, I wouldn't be worried with the guys we've just mentioned. It, it's kind of guys that it's new for. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to the crunch, you know, there's, there's a lot of kind of players who haven't probably experienced winning titles or winning cups. And it's, you know, to get across the line, especially in your first one, is massive. Yeah, and from the Shamrock Rovers' point of view, of course, they'll be disappointed to go out with the cup, but it does leave, uh, I suppose it reduces the hectic nature of the um, calendar somewhat, obviously still involved in the European Europa League or Europa Conference League group stages and still trying to keep ahead of uh, Derry City in the league. And um, they have Shelburne on Thursday as well, David, so you know, their focus is very quickly going to switch and also they'll probably be a little bit heartened by the way they responded in the second half yesterday. Yeah, like I think it's the nature of how Rovers have been over the last couple of years where they'll, yeah, they'll just have to take this defeat on the chain and, and move on, but they've been used to having to kind of do that in terms of games coming thick and fast and yeah, with the European side of things as well, like and <clears throat> I think they've probably been, I think the nature of a decent draw in their first game, I suppose, even though they might have been wanting to set a tone there, but like it was a decent performance. And then obviously in Ghent um, last week, that would have been like a really disappointing. And then just the nature of how they kind of just coughed up some of the goals and how the game got away from them very quickly. But then I think they've, they've shown pretty well that when it comes to the league, they can just switch back on, they can switch back into gear and put disappointments behind them. Like we're talking there earlier about, a kind of about bows and maybe a sense of a sense of drift like like shell similarly not a sense of drift but because they're not going to qualify for Europe through the league and they're not going to get relegated will their focus now switch a little bit will they just like they, they're the team who have to be at it hundred percent in every game. That's probably as Damien Duff was saying there they played the perfect game because they had that intensity and were able to marry with that little bit of quality that maybe hasn't always been there. Like, like Again, Moylan's goals kind of typify that. Moylan's goal typify that, and obviously Sean Boyd too. But so we'll if Shells kind of even switch off against Rovers, Rovers will punish them. Like that's because like Rovers are just levels above other teams in in the league. So I think he was looking at it from the point of view of you know maybe maybe if Rovers hadn't got the games in hand and there was coming to this stage of the season, you would probably think well that this could be a real psychological blow even in the in the league race. But I just think. Rovers have too much experience for that to, to kind of transfer it over. I don't think they'll have a big enough wobble for uh, for Derry to, to kind of take advantage. So I still fully expect them to kind of, when it, even though it's going to be their way, isn't it, in Talker Park as well. Of course, I think they still expect them there to go there and, and and be capable of grinding out a win. Because as you say as well, like with 10 men, like it still took Derry at home to kind of extra time to, to do it. And like, yeah. Like we talk about taking positives from any negative, that's that's what what Rovers players will not take from that. 
Yeah, we were talking about the Irish defence earlier. There has been a bit of updated news while we've been recording. So Andrew Amabamadele is out with a groin injury um, out of the squad. Right. Um, so we'll go for a shade there. So yeah, shade. yeah. So that that <laughs> that answers that. And Liam Scales brought in as well. Um, so that's the the latest news from the Ireland squad. But um, just on Shamrock Rovers finally, Gary. From what you saw against Ghent, I mean, before the match, we were talking about lessons that they had to absorb from Ferenc Varos and Luda Goretz in terms of spacing. Did you see any improvement on that front? Um, okay, the, their away games <coughs> have been, <coughs> excuse me, in, com- in complete contrast to their home games. Um, they've been just too easy, you know, to get to get at and too easy to score goals. Um, unfortunately for them, like and like you know. It's going to be tough away from home, and I I actually think Mould are possibly a better team than Ghent. Um, they, they they just have to learn from their mistakes, and they, they just have to be a bit tighter at the back and build it. You know, they can be they need to tighten that up because conceding three and four goals in in the away games it's just too many. And if you're going to be competitive and you're going to push on to the next level, that has to improve. And it, and it's not just that. Like I think Gaffey has been has been excellent for them and in Europe and led the line really well. But it's just it's the support and it's the distances between the lines that you've got to get right and you've got to be brave and you've got to play it in the right area. So the goal, you know, the the one that was played at the dagger, I don't like that play and it's four or five yards away. It's just too easy to to press, you know. And then you give if he gives the ball back to the goalkeeper, it's just I I just find that 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 play and the time and place, you know, you 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 kind of grow into the game and you develop it rather than putting pressure on yourself. So when you cough up easy goals like that. Um, it, it just gives you a mountain of climb and you can't give up anything easy in Europe because the teams and the quality of the opposition will will punish you. Yeah, and in the Women's National League, uh, Wexford, uh, top of the table there, beating Treaty United 3-0, Bohemians beating DLR Waves 2-1, Cork City beating Galway 1-0, P-Mount 2-0 winners over Sligo, and then Athlone Town 2-0 uh, winners over Shelburne, which is a huge result there. And then in the first division, Galway... Um, Obviously, look, it's coming a little bit too late for them. 2-1 win over Cork City. A great win for them, obviously, because in Cork, Cork and Galway have been terrific games this year, but there's been full houses at both games. And for, for Galway to come from behind uh, and to beat Cork uh, at home, it's great for all the support. There's so many, as you said earlier, there's so many kids and young people going to the games. And, and Galway is the same. They, they've really, they, you know, they've got a good fan base going to the games now. And for them, Look, they're not going to catch uh, Cork, but going into the playoffs, they've given great confidence, you know, to beat you know the team that's going to win the league, um, and and this this playoffs going to be really interesting with with uh, obviously Treaty and uh, Longford are in it as well, and but Waterford their form that they're showing, so it's going to be very very competitive, um, but you know, like I think for Galway, it's, it's they've had that kind of a blip where they've lost a few games, and and the Cork Cork should host home. Yeah, and then at Lone Town, uh, beating Cove Ramblers 3-1 as well. That's three wins from the last four for at Lone. And, I mean, they had a terrible start to the season, but they just seem to be finding form. Yeah, no, they, they, they've got things together. Obviously, Shane Keegan's gone in down in Cove as well. And, you know, he's got a little bit more structure and things. So that's a, that's a good win for at Lone. Like, they, you know, they've brought a couple of players in um, and, they, and they started to pick up a few results. Look, it, it, it's, it's like that in the first division. You can just... You have a really bad start, but then you can develop a little bit of form where you've got players kind of growing into the roles. And a lot of times you've got young players in these clubs and they're experienced senior uh, football, like if they're coming out of the under 19 league. So it does take a little bit of time to, to grow and develop and get used to the standards on the loan. Look, they're putting a few good results together and they'll be very happy with the, the results against Cove. Yeah, and then watching the Premier League yesterday, um, Arsenal obviously top of it now, but uh, beating Brentford 3-0 where they'd lost on the opening day last season and Fabio Vieira scoring a cracking goal for the third. And I think I remember seeing a picture of you, Gary, um, pictured with him on the day he was signing. Yeah, no, we did the deal for Fabio. Um, like He's a terrific talent, a really good technician. Um, you know, He's a dead ball specialist as well, so it's no surprise you know, to see him pop up into the area there and have the confidence and he just placed it in off the inside of the post. So, Terrific for him on his on his uh, on his full debut. You know, he came on against Man United last week, but you know, on his on his first Premier League start, you know, to show up and obviously put it like the team put in a really good performance. And then a few players uh, and to put in performance like that, three 0 win. Um, obviously Brentford beat them last year. And there was a lot spoken and written about it. So, um, delighted for him and, uh, and Arsenal are going really well. Yeah, title contenders or just simply top four, really. 
I think top four would be would be excellent for them. Uh, it's hard to look at. So title contenders, it, it, it looks Man City all over. Yeah, minute, whoever uh, whoever has Holland has going. kind of got the cheat code. I yeah, think, for like, that. Like, I know we spoke earlier in the year about Liverpool as well, but like you know, it's hard to look beyond Man City. Just the way that you know he's adapted to the Premier League, I didn't think there would be much um, you know problem with it. But just if we bring the quality of players that he has around him, and obviously he's got phenomenal quality himself, so he's really hit the ground running. And he'll benefit from from obviously Pep and the coaching team there, and uh, and like I said, the standard of players in that in that group, uh, not just on the pitch, but probably in the stands as well as the, as well as the bench. So it's it, uh, you know it's it's, uh, it's an interesting time there, Man City, and they've got a phenomenal group. Yeah, and David, I suppose the final one, um, obviously in the Arsenal game, the big talking point was, of course, the record, uh, Premier League record for youngest player being broken there. So Ethan Noaneri, um, mm-hmm. who um, has made his debut age 15, like this is probably just a fleeting appearance and then he'll be back with the U teams for the foreseeable. But um, it just brings up that conversation of how young is too young. I mean, there was the 13 year old at Glen yeah. Avon I saw as well. And then uh, it reminded me of Evan Ferguson when he got that game against Chelsea at 14 as well. I know, yeah, kind of like even like you said, a lot like who got a few guys like Fierda, he probably seems like an L lad, but he's only twenty two. Like he was coming <laughs> yeah. off, he's only coming off the pitch, you know what I mean? It just shows like the diff, like it's just crazy. Like saw some, like it's just it's it's a weird one. Like I don't think in the Premier League you're gonna be getting stunts in terms of like a lad getting thrown in. Just it just wouldn't happen. There's too much. Even when you're three 0 it just doesn't happen. And I think you see what what um, Arteta has been trying to do over the last while is like bring just get a different kind of mentality around that whole club. You know what I mean? So any 15 year old who's anywhere near that near that squad and is getting on, you clearly has serious talent. And it was only again since like since yesterday when you obviously learn a bit more about him. The fact that he was being involved at Arsenal under 18 since he was what 14 years of age. Like it's clearly someone they have they have high high hopes for and yeah like he's I don't think he's getting thrown on there for the stunt just because it's he's broken broken the record and then if you look at like everyone remembers when Ryan Rooney kind of like came on and scored that amazing goal against um against Arsenal like now he didn't have that quite kind of an impact but like any any teen like any teenager now really literally would get near a Premier League squad like must have serious it's gonna have serious talent because just the nature of how like the makeup, I know it's everything we said about how difficult it is for Irish players to be getting here when there's players coming from all over the world. So, like, it's it'd be one of those where hopefully it's not just a footnote in his career and like he goes on, and he can actually, but it's it's put the, it's put the spotlight on him now, you know what I mean? Like, whether or not, like, it's just, that's just the nature when people are going to be asking them, well, where is he now? And like, it's I don't know, like, he's not. I was going to say a marked man, but he's not even a man. He's not even 16. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Most definitely not, yeah. I'd say yeah, they'll uh, they'll be kind of wrapping him up in cotton wool over the next while anyway to make sure he's uh, kind of well protected and, uh, you know, kept away from the spotlight. But um, that brings us to a close. Um, obviously, Scotland against Ireland live on RT2, an RT player at 7pm on Saturday. And we'll also have the Armenia game as well and the 21s. Uh, David and Gary, thanks for coming on this week. No worries, no.